Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Today we're going to discuss the evolution of the manned supersonic bomber. Strategic bombing was proven during World War II, and at the beginning of the Cold War, the need for weaponry for a deterrent mission was paramount. The manned bomber became very, very important and a, uh, an important part of the nuclear triad. The nuclear triad consisted of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which could provide a very potent punch but could not be called back once they were launched. The nuclear-powered submarines that could be deployed undetected worldwide, giving mobility to America's nuclear punch. And the manned bomber, which provided flexibility. It could be launched on a nuclear mission, called back if required, directed to different targets uh, in flight, and the most versatile of the nuclear triad legs. I'm holding the B-70 model in my hand here, and this represented the fastest manned bomber ever flown at Mach 3.1, although it was never operational, and we're going to discuss why. But on the desk, you see the evolution from the B-58 uh, to the B-70, the FB-111, and the B-1, uh, which were all supersonic airplanes carrying out the mission of the Strategic Air Command. We're going to begin our program with the Convair B-58 Hustler the world's first supersonic manned bomber. These three Convair resin display models depict visually the evolution of an airplane in the best possible way. From the very first studies in 1949, the MX-1626 uh, was a concept that evolved to the MX-1953 and eventually the production B-58 airplane. But let's talk for a moment about the uh, existing strategic bombers of this era, and I think it'll really uh, reinforce the point of why these machines were so revolutionary at the time. The first jet-powered strategic bomber was the Boeing B-47 Stratojet. Uh, more than 2,000 B-47s were built in the late 1940s, early 1950s. Uh, that design evolved to the B-52, an eight-engine Stratofortress, believe it or not, still in service today. 744 B-52s were built. Uh, in the uh, 1950s and early 1960s. And the B-58, uh, which made its first flight in 1956, and only 116 B-58s were made. It had the shortest uh, operational lifespan of any of the bombers I just mentioned, and we'll discuss that a little later. You can see the resemblance in the cockpit area to the F-102 and the F-106, but it was Convair's first step in uh, the idea of a carrier aircraft with a separate weapons pod. And you can see that it's evident in the design that these are really two very separate structures that are integrated somehow into making an entire airplane. By comparison, the uh, MX-1953 is another step toward the B-58 in the sense that the weapons pod is more integrated into the shape of the fuselage. The inboard engines are pretty much as they uh, appeared on the production airplane. The outboard engines are going to change because they're mounted above the wing as you see here. And on the production B-58, uh, the weapons pod becomes a two-stage structure that is uh, adapted to the lower fuselage and is a combination fuel tank and the weapon itself uh, in the final uh, production version as you see here. The first step in the evolution of the B-58, uh, the MX-1626 that you see here, uh, was actually two separate components and you notice that the tail section on the pod becomes the tail of the airplane when the two sections are together. Uh, very missile-like with the four axes and the uh, engine pods on the outboard section of the wing uh, it was the very beginning of the idea of a separate weapons system uh, carried to the target by the carrier airplane. With the MX 1953 this provides the pivotal middle step toward the evolution toward the production airplane. Uh, you can see the cockpit area now is resembling the B-58 and most importantly, this has the area rule fuselage, the wasp waist uh, pinch configuration uh, to compensate for the wing area in the front view. As the pod detaches, you'll notice that the fins remain on the pod and not on the airplane. That was a big change. And uh, the carrier airplane now is uh, clean uh, for the return leg home. We've just seen the evolution of the B-58 airframe and configuration. Here's something really unique. This is a very special one-of-a-kind factory model from Convair showing a double-potted engine, which in a sense is a step back. The double-potted engine was used on the B-47. It augmented the thrust of the B-36. And to show you how uh, far they reached back in this era, they even had a jet-powered train. But this model represents a study, although it was never put into development, of uh, the double-potted engine with a um, 
much more modern airframe, area rule fuselage. The upper uh, surface slipper tanks as was used uh, in Great Britain. And it was a development that ultimately was never used for the final B-58 configuration. And by the way, what's really unique about this factory model is the wood insert on the base which mirrors the configuration of the airplane and is also reflected as a special logo on the tail fin. The production B-58 first flew on November 11th, 1956, piloted by Beryl Erickson, Converse chief test pilot. The production airplane represented a real breakthrough. It was the first Mach 2 bomber, a delta wing design as you can see here, area rule fuselage, powered by four General Electric J79 engines capable of 18,500 pounds of thrust each in afterburner. And the weapon pod, as you saw from the earlier designs, is now really an external drop tank, in essence, that surrounds the second stage, which is the weapon carrying pod. And that's what's delivered to the target. There were two problems early on that had to be solved with the B-58. One was high-speed escape, and the other was the uh, tire structure at the extremely high takeoff and landing speeds that this airplane had, unlike any other airplane previous. Uh, the tires were prone to rupturing on uh, takeoff and uh, landing, and that created problems with rupturing in the lower wing or ingestion into the engines. And these problems were solved by test pilot Fitz Fulton in a special program at Edwards Air Force Base, developing tires that could survive those loads. The escape system was uh, an escape pod rather than a seat, although seats were fitted to the early uh, test airplanes, but the escape pod that you see here in this photo was developed using both ground and air test ejections with black bears as subjects to make sure that they would survive the lows, which they did. There were 116 B-58s built. A number of them were lost in accidents early on, but the airplane uh, set 19 total world speed records, which stood until the SR-71 uh, beat those. It made the first supersonic transatlantic flight in 1963, and it won the Blerio, Harmon, Thompson, Bendix, and McKay trophies in those record attempts back in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, cruise speed was Mach 2.0, which is about 1,320 miles per hour, and uh, unrefueled range was just over 4,000 miles. The service ceiling was 64,000 feet, and the airplane weighed 175,000 pounds at takeoff. The airplane was operational from 1959 until 1970. A dramatically beautiful design, uh, but an example of uh, maybe a little bit too much airplane for the mission, uh, in the sense that the B-58 was retired in 1970, and the subsonic B-52 Stratofortress, which first flew in 1952, is still operational today. This is the WS-110 concept study from 1961, the world's first Mach 3, or triple sonic, strategic bomber. It's a North American design. North American won the uh, proposal competition with Boeing. North American had supersonic Mach 2 experience with the X-10 missile in 1953. The objective of the 110 study was to combine the payload and range of the Boeing B-52 with the speed of the Convair B-58. And that took a very large airplane. It was had six General Electric engines and a massive Delta wing uh, the crew compartment was here, and uh, fuel was uh, in the uh, aft fuselage and the wings as well, and this created the long-range triple sonic Mach 3 XB-70 study. Uh, this ex was expected to be the next supersonic bomber for the Strategic Air Command. With the shoot-down of uh, Francis Gary Powers in the U-2 in 1960, uh, the U.S. realized the vulnerability of uh, even high-altitude airplanes against the Soviet missile defenses. And the decision was made to favor the ICBM for the long-range nuclear delivery, and the B-70 as a, as a manned bomber was canceled in 1961. However, the government decided to uh, proceed with two experimental prototypes called XB-70s, uh, and that uh, carried this design into the 1960s and really created uh, some significant aeronautical history, and we'll talk about that now. The two experimental prototypes of the XB-70 were flown in the 1960s primarily to study shockwave propagation, supersonic transport characteristics, and to gather data on large high-speed airplanes. It is the largest airplane ever flown at Mach 3. The design goal was to fly at Mach 3 at 70,000 feet for 30 minutes, and that was attained in the mid-1960s. The airplane flew primarily at Edwards Air Force Base 
First flight of Ship 1 was September 21st, 1964, the same year as the SR-71. What you see are the delta wing configuration uh, with the wings uh, in the uh, takeoff and landing position as you see here and the in-flight position as you see on the smaller model. And this is the pivotal uh, design characteristic that allowed the airplane the, to achieve the performance it was able to achieve. The outer wing section would droop to 25 degrees initially and then 60 degrees as you see on this model. And that created a shock wave underneath the airplane onto what they called the six pack, which was the structure that held the uh, engines. This created the ability for the airplane to literally surf along its own shock wave in uh, high speed, high altitude flight to deliver a target to the Soviet Union. What happened, however, was that the uh, need for this airplane was overshadowed by the ability of the ICBM to deliver nuclear weapons as well as the Soviet air defense systems. So a Mach 3 airplane at 70,000 feet was no longer invulnerable to missile attack and uh, that created a whole different situation. But the two experimental airplanes motored on through the uh, mid-60s. One was lost in an accident, unfortunately. The surviving airplane is at the Air Force Museum to this day. It was a very uh, dramatic and exotic design and it uh, really paved the way for future technology in large aircraft and high-speed flight. The next step in the evolution of the manned supersonic bomber was the F-111, specifically the FB-111 bomber version, which evolved from the TFX program, the first variable geometry uh, production airplane. I have here the Navy version of the TFX, and that was the Grumman airplane. General Dynamics developed the Air Force version, but the bomber evolved in the mid-1960s to fulfill the requirement with the Strategic Air Command to replace the Convair B-58 Hustler. This was an amazingly fast airplane, faster than the B-58. This flew at Mach 2.5. It carried uh, Boeing AGM-69 Scram missiles, uh, which were standoff weapons carried in a bomb bay, as you see in this photo. Out of the 563 total F-111s built, 76 were the FB-111 bomber version. Uh, this airplane was replaced by the Rockwell B-1B, but it served uh, in Kosovo and in the Mideast uh, in a number of uh, combat situations. It was a very effective low-level airplane. The fighter version uh, first saw operations in the latter years of the Vietnam War. Uh, the airplane first flew in December of 1964, and this really was the uh, compilation of all the different design facets that we saw in the previous airplanes, the FB-111 medium-range supersonic bomber of the 1960s. Unlike the high-altitude delivery mission of the B-52, the low-level penetration mission of the B-1 was made possible by a very innovative design feature, namely the forward canard fins that you see here on the front of the airplane. These were uh, movable by digital control up to 60 times per second, measuring and uh, reacting to the air loads on the nose of the airplane and controlling the control surfaces at the wing and tail to compensate for whatever turbulence the airplane was experiencing. This resulted in a dampened uh, ride uh, that was as smooth as glass at uh, low altitude and high speed. But the shape of the airplane, the swept back wing, and the canard fin uh, made performance possible uh, that was just not even dreamt of at the time that the B-52 was the prime strategic bomber. The need for a variable geometry wing in a large strategic bomber is mainly to give the airplane low speed stability and uh, enhanced low speed performance at takeoff and landing and then as the mission evolves the wings are swept back to give the airplane high speed flight capability. The B1A had a top speed of Mach 2.2 uh, quite an impressive uh, speed for an airplane of this size. Uh, it was powered by four uh, General Electric F101 turbofan engines about 30,000 pounds of thrust each in full burner quite a powerful airplane for its size. Uh, and then the B-1B speed was reduced to Mach 1.6 uh, for the needs of a revised mission and the current airplanes are now no longer nuclear capable under the SALT treaty. But uh, the B-1A proved that a large, sleek, elegant looking, variable geometry strategic bomber was possible and uh, really a, a perfect ending to the story of the manned supersonic bomber. So there you have it, the story of the manned supersonic bomber and the evolution from the B-58 to the B-1 today. This XB-70 model represents the epitome of this quest for speed, 
and I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Until next time, take care.